coming up on TPI. So I got the news that my father had passed away when I was in New Zealand for an event. Nothing prepares you for that moment. Like, you never imagine that it will happen to you. And then it does. Hello and welcome to TPM, your host, Muyu Olari Waju. Thank you for joining me today for what we hope will be one of the highlights of your day. Now, I know I say that all the time, but I believe it to be true. Watching TPI would be one of the best ways to spend 30 minutes of your time. It's always our goal to leave you feeling better than how we found you. Well, first up, worship leaders from two different genres of music and two different backgrounds join forces to create an original sound and what happened next caught the attention of many. Ephraim Graham has the story. God, Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. Your current single, Rafa, how did that happen? What's the, the what drove it? Man, so much stuff was going on in the world and, and in our churches and and um, we and, and and family members and friends of ours lives. Mm -hmm. And man, we just one day were just like, man, we need to talk about who God is as being a healer. In the middle of the dark. We wrote a lyric in the song that says, We're leaning on your power. You'll do what can't be done. Either now or forever, we know it's gonna come. Where our help comes from. You both have individual testimony. You were addicted to meth, and I think I've heard you described it as yourself as a wounded preacher's kid. So how do you go from wounded preacher's kid to meth addict to worship leader? Right, uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, my dad was an evangelist. I grew up watching him preach on Sunday morning, and then behind closed doors, I saw him physically abuse my mom. I said, you know what, if God's real, he's not good. And I don't want anything to do with this Jesus guy. So I really quickly just started rebelling. 13, I'm smoking, drinking, 15, it's cocaine and pills and I'm selling drugs. And by the time I'm 17, I'm a full out crystal meth addict. I'm using crystal meth every day for almost six years. And uh, somebody gave me this book, uh, been praying for me called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Three o'clock in the morning, uh, I've got drugs on the side table next to me. <laughs> Nobody's playing softly in the corner, come as I am, come as you are, or whatever, you that know. Altar call. It's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's like seemingly the most improbable place for someone to get saved. And I, I say it's it's the kindness of a very real God to meet a wounded pastor's kid in a place completely untouched by the hands of man. And in this place we had like an internal dialogue. I, mean, I didn't audibly hear him, but I knew I was talking to him, you know. Um, he was like, you know, God, I want to give you my life. I want to quit all this addiction, all this darkness I've known for so long. I want to, but I can't. And the thought more powerful than words, I just feel like the Holy Spirit said, you won't do it, I'll do it. So were you a man on the run as well at some point? <laughs> um, no, not, my, my story is totally different. Mm -hmm. um, my um, grandmother was a minister of music at her church. My mom was a minister of music. My father was a minister of music. You know, we grew up in church. Um, my grandmother was the minister of music for 50 years almost. Uh, God has given me favor and put me around greatness a long time ago, and I didn't realize it as a kid. So what unites you two? Where, what happens that makes you guys say, you know, we should... The Lord. We should, the, we should, somebody should, called Jesus. We yeah, should make absolutely. albums together. <laughs> right. We live really close to each other. We live like 10 minutes. We've, we've known each other for a long time. We're both in Louisville, and uh, we both have been in the this industry, whatever you want to call it, uh, during the pandemic, we were like, hey, let's get together and do something. And we did, and it was so fun. Like, it wasn't work at all. It was like, oh my gosh, I love this. But there were some people going, hey, you know, some people are watching you guys around here and are paying attention to this and uh, wondering what, what God's up to, you know? I mean, so that so, the union literally comes at the height of 
some tough racial stuff tension mm-hmm. in Definitely. this country. Not that we thought about we it like that, because to be honest with you, this is a very kingdom friendship. It's mm-hmm. not, oh, hey, we should do something because I'm white and you're black. Uh, it's no, it's, man, I love you. Let's do something together. This is fun. And it became that, not because it was what we were intending, right? And, it, and it's us not trying to turn each other into each other. It's us being who we are. Mm-hmm and allowing God and allowing the truthful conversations to happen. We're able to say, he, he'll call me sometimes like, Jay, I need to get this off my chest. And just have, what a, conversation just have a conversation. It. And I think that that's what helps build kingdom and what's building the relationship is you're able to listen to my story. You're able to listen to the hardships and the things that I've been through and, and get a understanding of why this is like this and why my culture is like this. And I, and I get an understanding of why your culture is like this, which makes it easier for us to do ministry together. I think genuine love and grace, which those are big words to throw around, but at their core, um, they honor you and they honor each other. And you like with real love and grace, you begin to trust each other. So he can say whatever he wants to me because I know him and I love him and he has grace to do that with me and vice versa. I think the whole idea of the kingdom is this. When we're fixed on the Lord, we're not fixed on each other, right? I mean, it says in when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and we'll all sing together to him, holy, holy. And it'll, and it'll all be different tongues, different yeah. nations. There won't be a Kirk Franklin room. <laughs> there won't be a Hillsong room. It'll just be all at once adoring him. And I think with us, we just like, we do it. If you like it or not, mm-hmm. you know, it's what God gave us and we, we roll with it and people are, they're grabbing a hold to it. The anointing that's on Jason and Stephen as they sing is so real. What they're doing together through music is creating a greater impact than anything they could have done alone. Amen to that. Up next, Bianca Batendog began her career riding waves at the tender age of eight and quickly rose to the top of the surfing ranks in South Africa and Europe. Bianca lost her desire to surf at the height of her career after her father, who was her number one cheerleader, unexpectedly passed away. Here's her story. Being in the water is the closest you can get to heaven. God speaks to me when I'm out in the water and I feel most comfortable speaking to Him. It's like a moment of solitude and it can last up to two hours. So that's my therapy, it's my escape. My first surf contest was when I was about eight years old. By the time I was 16, I'd won all the South African championships and I started competing on the European circuit up until the age of 18. Ended up winning the European tour. A world of possibilities opened that previously did not exist. My relationship with my father was wonderful. I think more wonderful because I got to travel with him one-on-one for the majority of my life. I remember one time I was like a 10-year-old little girl and someone dropped in on me. (laughs) And I remember telling my dad and he paddled up to the guy and I just remember the guy getting off his board, swimming down and trying to swim away underwater so his board was like following like him like that so I always felt very safe so I got the news that my father had passed away when I was in New Zealand for an event Nothing prepares you for that moment, eh? Like, you never imagine that it'll happen to you. And then it does. I really felt like I lost the protection and the guidance. So I was like, 
in the world alone. A lot of times you read like, the Lord is my strength in, in the Bible and you kind of flip past it and it's just theory where when you can't get out of bed because you're in su such a dark place, the Lord really is your strength. Like, it becomes very much practical. Honestly, the year after my dad passed away, I just couldn't care less whether I was going to win a heat, lose a heat, stay on tour, get knocked off, serve, not serve, really made no, didn't matter at all. I guess my whole perspective of and my priority list just flipped around completely. That fleeting moment of sporting success was just gone. I knew that that direction was not leading anywhere. After years of traveling and seeing the extremes of social classes, what I originally thought was normal, the gap between rich and poor, I realized was not normal. You just see these innocent little things that are born into it and then choose it at the mercy of their situation. Ever since then, I feel like I've just had the desire to bridge the gap between my privilege to the reality of what's happening on that side of town. The first time I got exposure to life community services in George, our high school did an outreach just like one day and I remember walking onto the premises and being like, whoa. So I've seen Morena, the founder of Life Community Services, like walk through the township like she belongs there. She's completely bridged the gap and she's committed to it. The Life Community Services try and give the kids a chance at life, a foundation in education, uh, identity in God and meeting basic needs. Between the three of those or those three platforms, I really think they open a child's scope to dream. We say if you want to become a film director, you can. If you want to become an architect, you can. If you want to go to the moon, you can. We open the ceiling of limitation completely and say, this is the first opportunity of many, how can we help you? Ever since my father passed away, I kind of realized that my professional or competitive career was going to come to an end until they announced that surfing is included in the Olympic Games. I was surfing the event over three or four consecutive days and things were just going my way one too many times for me to take credit for it. I mean, I was 17th seed out of 20 girls, which is like third last. And I made it to the final. Um, I, I just felt like I was part of something bigger. Big rainbow just appeared out of a typhoon sky and I just knew God was with me, he has a plan. I'd seen miracles happen. I recognized one when it was happening. And I felt like it was specifically for life because I know sporting success comes and goes very quickly and that I had a small window of opportunity to use the exposure and plant it back into an organization that changes the lives of children eternally. I came home quite early. My whole family was there and the whole surfing community of Vic Bay and then most importantly the kids at Life sang a song and that just broke me.
I feel like the first time in a long time I am where I'm meant to be. Specifically involved in life, but more importantly, we are made to give our time and whatever we can. A sporting success never brought me fulfillment. All the privileges I've had never brought me contentment, but this does. So I really feel like I'm in the right place. What God says, the first will be last and the last will be first, I just, that just like became so clear. What everyone else is chasing, Moraine and Philip are chasing the opposite. When people are building bigger walls, they're just making the table longer for guests. And I'm just a big fan and inspired daily by her relentless drive to make what we think is impossible, possible. The anchor is focusing on what truly matters, serving others. The fleeting moments of sporting success, although grand, do not bring fulfillment. Bianca has found her true calling in lifting others, and we all can learn from her example. Coming up next, a psychic who communicates with dead spirits finally meets her match. Stay tuned and see what happens. You know, walking around in my home and being afraid to be alone, locking all the doors, but nobody was there, not knowing why, and when I would see dark figures and shadow figures, that was scary. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. Welcome back. For most of her career, Jennifer was celebrated as a psychic medium who could see into people's futures and tell their fortunes. It was all fun and games until she came in contact with dark sinister forces with powers stronger than her. Take a look. You know, walking around in my home and being afraid to be alone, locking all the doors, but nobody was there, not knowing why. And when I would see dark figures and shadow figures, that was scary. Jennifer Niza Hofacker was a child when she was introduced to the occult. For Jen, it was normal, and she was encouraged to become a medium herself. I had been a psychic medium for years. I uh, did other forms of divination, and I actually had my own divination class, manifesting, chakra balancing, tarot card reading. I was teaching all of it, and I loved it. I loved that life. As a psychic, Jen felt she was doing good things helping people deal with grief or making important life decisions. But before long, she began to realize that she was tapping into a spiritual darkness that had severe consequences. The supernatural is intriguing. So we're looking for peace, we're looking for comfort, and we're looking for answers. We're looking for that compass in our life, but um, there's two supernatural sources of where you can go, and you can go to God or you can go to the devil. But the devil is very deceptive and manipulative the long-term consequence is eternal separation from God. The short-term consequence is destruction. Growing up, you know, seeing things and feeling things, um, very, very scary, and that was where a lot of my anxiety had came from, and I would have full-blown anxiety attacks, panic attacks, like frozen in fear just from seeing or hearing or something. It got to a point that it was so dark and so hard, and I just cried out, to Christ one day and I didn't understand that I didn't get that because I never really knew him he showed up there I know I know it was him and there was peace and I felt peace but I didn't understand the experience which left me spiritually vulnerable I didn't want to be a psychic anymore but I didn't know why later that year Jen reconnected with a friend from her divination class who had become a Christian 
She invited Jen and her family to church. She told us about Jesus and she told us about this church and she invited us. And my husband went and he loved the church and he was like, Jen, I just want you to come. Four weeks later, it took a whole month, and I just woke up that day and I said, I don't know why, but I want to go to that church today. You know, people are worshiping, their arms are up, the words are on the screen, it was so beautiful. I'm singing, Jesus saved me, the lyrics, Jesus saved me, and it was a, like a flashback. I went right back to that moment when I cried out to him months prior, and it was like, all of a sudden I just knew. It was like confirmation, that's him. You know, I could cry. He saved me. You know, he he saved my life. He saved my life eternally. Like, this is really Jesus. This is really the Son of God. Wow. And I started crying. Jen's heart began changing as she experienced the love of God for the first time. When I went home from that church, the first thing I did was Google search, what does the Bible say about psychic mediums? And there were like 100 verses. I say, like, oh no, and Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12, you shall not consult or practice any form of divination. And he mentions the word medium. And I was like, he's talking to me. That's nine years ago. That was the beginning of my life, really. Jen put her faith in Christ as Lord of her life. And since then, he has used her testimony to tell others about the dangers of the occult. Jen has written books and published videos online detailing her experiences to show others the depth of Jesus' love and mercy. I think the gravity of my salvation is so heavy. It compels me to constantly share the gospel, constantly point to Christ. I want people to see who God is. And if even one person is ever reached by those videos, hearing the truth about the demonic nature and they could get away from it, Thank God, I've seen wonderful things. God is moving in mighty ways. Every day I'm thankful for him. Every day I'm thankful and for the way that he did it too because he knows me. He knew what it would take. He let me get to the end of myself or what feels like people call it, you know, a rock bottom. And he did that for me and he gave me another chance. The scripture Jen mentions comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 to 12, where God says, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. If you're dabbling in these things and are tormented by dark forces, I have good news for you. Jesus can set you free. Jesus has the power to free you and wants to help you just like he helped Jen. The first step is for you to surrender your life to Jesus and ask him to come into your life. We can do that right now through a simple prayer. All you have to do is open your mouth and talk to God. He is listening to you. So say these words after me if you really want to. Lord Jesus, I want to be free from these powers that are tormenting me. I want to be free that my mind is not overwhelmed by fear and my heart overtaken by the things that could go wrong. Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that you are the son of God. I confess that you died for me to give me a brand new start. Come into my life, come into my home, change everything. Jesus, I confess that you are Lord. Amen. If you'd like to know how to have a personal relationship with Jesus, please message us on WhatsApp. We have prayer counselors standing by to pray with you. For our viewers in the United States and Europe, please call us using the number on your screen. All our contact details are also on our website. Now don't go anywhere. We have more truth, power, and inspiration for you right after this.
call us on 0300-561-0700 or visit the website at www.cbneurope.com forward slash TPI. Welcome back. Want to invite you to join the TPI family by going to our website and hitting the subscribe button. As a member, you'll receive personal monthly video messages with prayers and words of encouragement from me and the TPI team. Plus, you'll be up to date on all things TPI. And the best part, it's free. So take a moment now and subscribe. Well, we've come to the end of the program, but I want to leave you with one final thought. It was written on the T-shirt of worship leader Jason Claiborne, who we saw earlier in the program, and it says this, pray about it, then be about it. I like that. Let's be hearers and doers of God's word. We leave you today with music from guests we had in the studio a few years ago. Here's singer-songwriter Darius Drock Jackson singing his latest single, I Got a Friend. From all of us here at TPI, goodbye and God bless you. Talk about loyalty, he get it. Talk about trust, he get it. Longevity, yeah, he get it. <laughs> Do it, cause he first loved me. When I look at my father, that's the way I want.